So hello everyone uh, and welcome to the uh, Ensemble uh, Genome Browser Virtual Workshop. Um, I'm glad that you've all been able to um, join me um, today uh, for the opening session of our um, three-day workshop. So um, what we're hoping to do um, over the course of the next three days is to introduce you to uh, all of the different types of data um, that you can explore uh, and retrieve from the Ensemble Genome Browser web interface. Um, as you would have known from the, um, the registration um, form when you signed up for the course originally, um, we have a course next week uh, on the REST API, which um, is being delivered by my colleague, Emily Perry. Um, and some of you uh, are already registered for that course as well. Um, so today um, and tomorrow and Thursday, we're gonna be focusing uh, on the Ensemble Genome Browser itself. So just to give you a bit of an uh, introduction to um, how this course is going to work, um, the, the three days, um, we have three hours on each day, uh, and each day will be split into two sessions. So today we're going to have a, a start, uh, our starting session will be an introduction to the Ensemble Genome Browser. We'll think about some of the, the main data types we have and, and how, we, how that's all organized. Um, then we're going to have a look um, at exploring regions across the, the genome uh, in the genome browser itself. Uh, and then in the second session, which will start approximately around 3.30 um, in the UK time, we're going to move on to look at our first type of um, data, which is the uh, ensemble gene annotation, uh, and thinking about how we can look um, for genes in the ensemble browser uh, to find more information uh, about those. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be looking at the variation data uh, and the VEP tool, the variant effect predictor, um, in the first session. And in the second session, we'll be looking at comparative genomics, um, looking, comparing genes and genomes uh, in ensemble. Uh, in ensemble. Uh, and then on the final day, we're going to be having a look at the features that regulate gene expression. So looking at the ensemble regulatory build, seeing how um, we've used data to, to annotate features such as promoters uh, and enhancers across the, the human and mouse genomes. Uh, and then we'll be finishing uh, on a session looking at the Biomart data export tool for retrieving tables of ensemble data. Uh, and we'll have a short session at the very end thinking about how we can visualize our own data uh, within the ensemble genome browser as well. So each of these modules um, has a particular structure. So we'll start off with a presentation, just thinking about what the data or the tool is um, and then how we process um, or produce that data. Then we'll move on to a hands-on demo. So we'll think about how to actually use the Ensemble browser or the, the tool that we're looking at in that session um, to retrieve or analyze the data itself. Uh, and the demo session really gives you an opportunity to follow along if you want to. Uh, some people find that they learn best just by watching, which you're more than welcome to do. Um, but if you want to open up a new tab in your browser and, and follow along with me, um, you're more than welcome to do that as well. And people often find that's the best way to, to help them get used to the interface and to, to learn and follow along. Uh, and then we'll move on to an exercise session. So after each module, um, there are some exercises that we can um, complete uh, within the Zoom call itself in the time that we have. Um, and the exercises just give you an opportunity to um, have a go at using the Ensemble Genome Browser. So there are lots of different exercises, um, more than actually you'll probably have time to do. Um, so what I would advise you to do is to pick the one or two that are the most interesting to you based on your species and your area of research perhaps. Uh, and to have a go at those and then move on to the others if you have time. You don't have to do the exercises at all. In fact, if you have your own gene of interest or your own species of interest, we're more than happy for you to move away uh, and begin exploring Ensemble in your own way. Uh, and you can obviously still ask us questions if, if there are things that you want to know. So um, where to go to get course materials? Um, we've also placed the course materials online. Um, I think Emily is probably about to put a link for you in the chat box as well. Uh, if not, I'll do that in just a moment. Um, so uh, we have an online training portal where all of our materials for our courses are, are uploaded. So if you follow the link that Emily has provided to you there, uh, training.ensemble.org, um, I'll take you through now to be able to find the presentations uh, and then the course book and question book and answer book um, for our course that we're going to be having today and this week. So if you go to training.ensemble.org in your browser, 
This will take you not to the Ensemble Genome Browser, but our training pages. So if you click on this link in the bottom left-hand corner, find materials from training. It will take you to our calendar of training events and you can see at the top here, Virtual Browser Workshop. This is our um, event, our calendar event. Uh, and here you can find uh, a PDF of the presentation slides, a PDF of the course book. Um, the course book contains the screenshots from the demos that we're going to be going through. The question book contains the exercises uh, and then the answer book contains the worked answers for the exercises. Uh, and then finally the copy sheet, uh, we won't need that today, um, but that's just a text file with some, with some small data sets that we're gonna be copying and pasting at various points in, in the different demos. Uh, and there's also a link to the living doc there as well. So I'll put this in the chat box for you as well. Fantastic. So these materials will remain online for you to use. Um, so you can either download them now or you can come back here in the future uh, and access these as references um, when you're working through Ensemble in the future. So the objectives of our course um, are to think about what Ensemble is, um, the different types of data we have uh, and how you can navigate around the Ensemble genome browser to access those different types of data that you might be interested in. Uh, and finally, uh, I want to show you also where you can go for further help and documentation. We just have uh, just a few hours together uh, on each day, so um, I'm not going to be able to show you everything. So knowing where to go for help and documentation will also be uh, really important as well for you. So I want to start just by giving you uh, an introduction to the Ensemble project and, and the genome browsers in general. So genome browsers um, are very important. Um, they provide sci us scientists with a way uh, of interacting and retrieving data from the genome, um, which would have been annotated with lots of different types of data and genomes of different species. So um, the first organism actually to have its genome sequenced was a bacteriophage. So back in the 70s, um, Fred Sanger and his team um, in Cambridge here in the UK um, sequenced uh, a bacteriophage with a genome of just five kilobases in size. So by today's standards, um, that's obviously a very small amount of um, DNA to sequence. Um, but that technology really laid the foundations for more and more complex organisms to have their genome sequenced uh, until in the early 2000s, uh, we had the publication of the first draft of the human genome sequence, which is three gigabases in size. So you can see just in those few decades how the technology improved um, to being able to sequence a, a species with a genome uh, of three gigabases. Since then, obviously, um, we've the sequencing technology has um, increased and improved in, in efficiency and cost and speed um, to the point where we can sequence genomes in a very, very short space of time um, at a very, very low cost. So what that really means now is that um, we're coming into an age uh, of genome data where there's almost too much um, to, to keep up with. So this is one of the, the things that Ensemble is working towards at the moment, uh, is trying to um, represent as many genomes for as many different species as possible. So we're going to be um, looking at the Darwin Tree of Life, for example, uh, and the Vertebrate Genomes Project to, um, represent the to, to present the genomes uh, and annotation for um, lots of vertebrate and non-vertebrate species um, uh, around the world. There are also projects that obviously look at sequencing lots of different individuals within a single species. So the 1000 Genomes Project was a good example of this um, that came to completion in, in 2014, um, where um, over two and a half thousand people in different populations around the world had their genome sequenced um, in, with the aim of identifying um, common variants uh, in different populations around the world. So um, this is what Ensemble tries to do, is it tries to represent um, all of this genomic data that's being produced by lots of different projects and collaborations around the world. So when these projects um, sequence a genome, for example, um, what we're actually going to be retrieving is uh, a sequence of A's, T's, G's and C's. And this is what it might look like when it's deposited uh, in a public archive. So um, Ensemble is not a sequencing project. We don't sequence any genomes ourselves. We rely on scientists 
individual research groups and collaborations um, to sequence the genomes of different species and then to deposit those genomes into publicly available archives um, like ENA, GenBank and DDBJ. Um, and then once those genome assemblies are public, Ensemble can retrieve those uh, and put, those, put them into our own databases uh, and to begin performing annotation ourselves. So when we get the genomes, they look a bit like this. Um, and then Ensemble as a genome browser, we take this uh, data and we annotate it with genes, variation, we compare the genomes and the genome sequences across species uh, in some comparative uh, analyses. Uh, and we also annotate features that regulate gene expression, such as promoters and enhancers. Uh, and then we make it all available through our genome browser um, and APIs uh, and FTP site, for example, to make it available to scientists around the world. So uh, to do this, uh, Ensemble um, has four main types of data, which we uh, will just quickly touch on now, just to um, give you a broad overview of, of the different data we have. So firstly, we have the genomic assemblies, um, which, as I say, we retrieve from publicly available archives. Uh, and then we begin um, with by performing automated uh, gene annotation across all of the, the genomes that we have in Ensemble. There are some species that also have some manual gene annotation incorporated, which we're going to be thinking about later on today as well. The second type of data is the variation data. So this is, um, again, taken from public um, archives, public variation databases, um, and we look for small and large scale sequence variation data with things like phenotype associations and allele frequencies as well. The third type of data is the comparative genomics. So this is where we compare the genes and the genome sequences um, by performing things like um, whole genome alignments and by constructing gene trees. Uh, and then finally, we have the annotation of regulatory features such as promoters and enhancers using experimental data, such as ChIP-seq data, um, DNA methylation data. And we use that um, to, to, um, to annotate those promoters, uh, those regulatory features across the genome uh, of both only human and mouse at the moment. So to draw these branches of data together, uh, Ensemble has a number of features. So um, we have actually now what we call our gene builds, which is um, the gene annotation for over 200 different species now. Uh, and then we also have the, the other main types of data. You can also upload um, and visualize your own data uh, in the Ensemble genome browser um, in, a, in a way that you can begin comparing it with the publicly available data that we have um, for everyone to display. We have a, a suite of tools for processing and analyzing your own data, such as the VEP, uh, which we're going to look at tomorrow. Uh, and then you can begin exporting the data on uh, a number of different scales. So all of the data that we're thinking about here can be um, uh, viewed and explored and exported from the, the genome browser itself. Um, but you can begin exporting tables of uh, ensemble data using the Biomart tool, uh, which we're going to look at on the final day. Uh, and then you can also access the data programmatically through the Perl and the REST APIs, which is the, the focus of next week's course with Emily. Uh, the best thing about all of this is that it's completely open source. So all of the data um, is completely uh, is free for you to take uh, and use in your research. So as I said, we have over 200 different species uh, in Ensemble now. Um, and the Ensemble project is dedicated to vertebrate species. Um, so we try and cover the broadest taxonomic space possible um, for vertebrates. So we obviously have human and the other great apes. Um, and then a large number of other primates uh, and placental mammals, um, including agriculturally and conservationally important species as well. Uh, we also have marsupials and monotremes, if you're interested in mammalian evolution, um, as, as well as obviously a large number of birds, fish, reptiles and amphibians as well. So as I said, Ensemble um, is dedicated to looking at vertebrate uh, genomes and genome annotation. So all of the data that you can um, explore for the vertebrates is through here, www.ensemble.org. But we also have a sister project called Ensemble Genomes. Um, and this is um, essentially the Ensemble Genome Browser for non-vertebrate species. So we have separate pages for bacteria, fungi, protists, metazoa, and plants. So if you're studying a non-vertebrate species that falls in one of these categories, 
You can access the Ensemble Genome Browser um, for these different taxa through ensemblegenomes.org. Uh, we'll have some various examples today where we go out uh, and have a look at Ensemble Genomes as well, as I know that I think most of you are studying vertebrate species, but I think there are a few people that are studying non-vertebrate species as well. One of the important things to remember um, when you're using both Ensemble and Ensemble Genomes uh, is that we work with a release cycle. So every three months approximately, um, we release a new version of Ensemble that includes um, all the most up-to-date data and annotation that we currently have. So uh, for example, in November of last year, we released Ensemble 102, and that's the current version. Uh, and at the moment, we're currently in the process of looking for new genome assemblies, uh, updating some underlying software, reperforming annotation and comparative analyses, for example, updated updating variation data and regulation data da databases. Um, and then we package that all up and we release it um, as a new version. So in February, so next month, we're gonna release Ensemble 103, which will be the, 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 the new current version of Ensemble that contains the most up-to-date data. And that's the way that we have of keeping up, um, keeping up to speed with, with all of the new data that's being um, generated in, around the world. Importantly, um, we keep the archives of Ensemble available for five years. So um, if you are using Ensemble next month or perhaps in the summer this year, uh, and you want to see what the, what the data was like when you first began using Ensemble today, for example, in 102, um, you can go back to the archives and view the Ensemble 102 archive um, to see how the data would have looked at the time when you first saw it, for example. Um, and this, is, this means that everything is traceable uh, and that you can see how the data might have changed or whether there's been a new um, phenotype association to, to your gene of interest, for example. So um, the, the archives are something that are important to use um, and I'll show you how to find those as well. Ensemble Genomes works in a very similar way, um, but it's a younger project. So at the moment we're on Ensemble Genomes um, 49 uh, and the, so the, the release number is just lower. The final thing, um, well, one of the final things that I want to think about before we start our first demo um, is thinking about what a genome assembly actually is. So when we think of a genome, um, we think of perhaps all of the DNA within a cell. And we can try and make an analogy where we're thinking of the, the globe, so the, the earth where we all live. Um, the genome assembly actually is a representation of the genome. So it's like a, a genome map. Um, and the, we all know that the thing with maps is that they they can they can vary in quality and completeness um, depending on where they've come from and what time they were made. So, for example, we can think perhaps about uh, a 16th century map of of the world. Um, obviously, lots of information missing, lots of gaps, lots of errors, uh, and this is maybe what a poor quality genome assembly might look like. Um, where there might be some um, sequencing errors, where there might be some um, assembly errors, or there might be some gaps in the assembly. But obviously, over time, as the sequencing technology improves, these maps can be improved um, so that the spaces are filled and errors are corrected. So um, it's just always important to remember that when you're looking in Ensemble, you're looking at the genome assembly, which is basically it's a representation of the genome, um, which is the best that we currently have, and it's likely to improve over time uh, as, as, we, uh, as we improve the technologies. So genomes are sequenced. Um, there's lots of different technologies for sequencing genomes now, um, but generally the technology um, can be summarized in this way. And this is a cartoon that tries to represent it in a, in a very simplified overview. Um, but generally what happens is um, a large genome, there's obviously many millions or billions of base pairs long. It's fragmented uh, into these short fragments. So maybe short reads of 150 or, or 200 base pairs long. Um, and then those fragments are sequenced. Uh, and then what happens is that those sequenced fragments or what we call reads um, are then, um, over, uh, we use computer alignment software to match up where those sequenced reads overlap to then produce uh, a an agreed sequence here. So you can see here these four reads all indicate that at this position 
there is a T. So this is what we call the genome assembly at the bottom here. So this is the inferred sequence based on the matched up um, sequencing reads, the overlapping sequencing reads. So when you're actually making a genome assembly, um, this is again, a simplified overview of the process. Um, uh, and it will, it, this then leads into how we represent it in the Ensemble Genome Browser as well. So um, this is slightly perhaps um, older technology. This is maybe a bit redundant now, but this is how the human genome was originally sequenced uh, and assembled. So BACs, um, bacterial artificial chromosomes from different individuals were sequenced. Um, so big plasmids had obviously uh, a small um, sequence of the human genome inserted uh, and were sequenced. Um, and then those sequenced backs from different individuals were assembled together to form a tile path. So this is one clone, this is one back clone, this is another back clone, for example, uh, and together these back clones form the tile path. Uh, and then the overlaps of these um, clones um, are trimmed to give contigs. So this is one contig here in light blue, and this is another contig. And this is the, con the clone that this contig is derived from. And here we can see the next contig that this, uh, the next contig that is derived from this clone. Uh, and then a run of contigs together with no gaps is called a scaffold. So this is a scaffold here, which is two contigs together, two or more contigs together in this case. So this is one scaffold and this is another scaffold. Uh, and then finally, um, the final step is to use genetic maps to assemble the scaffolds uh, onto a chromosome. So obviously we need to work out which orientation these scaffolds exist in and where they are relative to one another. Uh, and it's important to remember, um, thinking about the human genome in, in particular at this point, uh, is that the, the human genome uh, is not actually the genome sequence of a single individual. Uh, the, clone, the, the contigs actually come from a range of different individuals who each donated, donated their genetic material to the Human Genome Project. Now, it turns out that um, about 70% of the clones um, actually come from one uh, individual um, from Buffalo in, in, um, in the US. Um, but it's important to remember that when you're looking at the sequence, it might be that clone A comes from one person and the, the clone just downstream will come from, uh, the contig just downstream will come from another individual. Uh, and finally, we also um, have different versions of genome assemblies. So again, thinking about human as an example, but this obviously the same principle extends to all the other species as well, is that as the technology improves, uh, new versions of the genome assembly um, are released just in the way that a new version of a map might be released um, if we're going back to our analogy about the earth. So the most current version of the human genome assembly is called GRC H38. It's also called HG38 in uh, different um, other genome browsers and, and, and other databases. Uh, but this is the data that you'll get through the www.ensemble.org pages. Before that, there was a genome assembly called GRC H37. Um, so this was, this was the most complete and up-to-date genome assembly uh, until around about 2014 when GRCH38 was produced. Um, and there's, there are some gaps um, within the GRCH37 uh, um, genome assembly, which were later filled. Um, but many people do still use this genome assembly, particularly uh, in, clinical, um, in clinical variant reporting, for example. Um, so we know that many communities use this data uh, and we have a dedicated archive called grch37.ensemble.org where you can get uh, the human genome 37 uh, data as well. That's also called HG19 in, in some databases. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the first presentation. Um, are there any questions at this stage? I'm looking just in the, in the participant um, list to see if there are any raised hands. So if you have any question, please feel free to either raise your hand or to unmute yourself or to type it into the chat box. I don't think there are any questions immediately, but um, obviously during the first exercise session, we can um, 
deal with any questions then as well. So in our first demo, we're going to have a look at the Ensemble homepage uh, and how we can find information about the species uh, and the genome assemblies that we have in Ensemble. So if you're following along in the course book, um, the screenshots start on page six, um, or you can follow along with me as well. So in your internet browser, you can type www.ensemble.org. And that will take you to the main Ensemble homepage. So um, there's quite a lot going on here. So I just want to quickly walk you through what you can see um, while you also perhaps open up a window and, and navigate here as well. So at the top, you can see this blue navigation bar. This appears at the top of every page in Ensemble. So you can always use the links here to come back to the homepage by clicking the logo um, or to navigate to one of the different tools or the documentation, for example. So we're going to explore these links in more detail through the course, um, but this blue bar will always appear at the top of every page. Uh, and there's also a quick search option as well, where you can um, just type in perhaps a new gene of interest and, and quickly navigate there rather than coming back to the home page. Uh, on the main part of the page, you can see this main um, search box here. Um, we're going to use this a lot throughout the course, uh, and this is your main portal uh, into the ensemble data. So here you can search for gene names, gene IDs, genomic coordinates, variant IDs, phenotypes. You can put in lots of different types of search terms here to begin exploring the ensemble data. So we're going to use this um, later on. Over on the right hand side, we have information about the release number. So you can see here we have Ensemble Release 102, which is our current release number. Obviously, we'll have Ensemble 103 that's being released uh, next month. Back to the left-hand side, you can see information about the species that we currently um, present in Ensemble. I want to view this again in just a moment, but there's a link at the bottom of the page I want to show you before we look back at the species. So if you go to the bottom, uh, in the right-hand corner, you can see this link here. Um, it's just hidden away. It's called View in Archive Site. So if you click here now, you'll open up a pop-up window um, that shows you all of the available archives um, for the Ensemble Genome Browser. So at the very top, you can see we have the dedicated archive, the Ensemble GRCH37. Uh, and then we have, uh, in chronological order, the Ensemble releases going back in time. So if, for example, you retrieved some data from Ensemble in July of 2019, Ensemble 97, um, you can click here and it will take you to the Ensemble 97 archive. You can see the colors changed, so it's now this brown color, just to let you know that you're not currently um, in the, uh, the main Ensemble genome browser uh, and you're viewing the data um, as frozen in time as it would have been uh, in July 2019. So just going across to the chat box, um, there's a couple of questions um, that I just want to address before we move on in our demo. So the first question is, um, which web browsers are compatible with Ensemble? So at the moment, I'm using um, Google Chrome. Um, that's quite, um, that works quite well and, and is supported with, Ensem uh, with the Ensemble Genome Browser. Um, but we also officially support um, Firefox and Safari as well, uh, as well as the Internet Explorer, which I think is now called Edge. Um, I have found in the past that um, some of the uh, visualization of the data and, and the images isn't so, um, isn't so clear in, with Edge, but it depends on what you have. So Chrome, Firefox, Safari or Edge should, should work for you. Um, and then there's someone as well who has a question. Uh, I have a question, not sure how to raise hands. So um, I'm happy to unmute you um, if you're happy to ask your question out loud. Um, let's find you. Yeah. Okay, so you're unmuted now. Yeah, Nakama. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, hello.
Yes, we can hear you. Um, do you have a question? Okay. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there. So what I'll do is I'll just mute you again, uh, Neshama. And um, maybe you can write your question in the, in the chat box and Emily will, will be able to help you there. So um, going back to the demo. Going back to the demo, um, you can see that we have the, um, the archive uh, and the URL itself has changed. So now instead of the www, we now have the july 2019archiveensembleorg So if you want to go back to the main Ensemble browser, you can just type the www back in there uh, to the URL prefix. Okay, so if you want to find out more information about the species um, that are available, um, you can go to this section on the main homepage um, where you can view a full list of all the species. Um, or you can click on this list here that says view full list of all species. And this will take you to a table uh, that contains information about all the species that we have in Ensemble. So if we look at the African ostrich, for example, you can see this is the species name, the common name, the scientific name, the taxon ID and the assembly name, and then also the accession number. So this is the unique number um, of the genome assembly in the public archive where, it's, um, where it was deposited. So if you're using uh, genome uh, data, perhaps from a number of different databases or across different genome browsers, you can ensure that you're looking at the same data across the different um, resources that you're using by looking to see whether the, the accession number uh, matches up across the different resources. If you want to find your species of interest, you can use the filter here um, in the top right-hand corner. So I can just begin typing Homo sapiens, for example, uh, to find human. Uh, and you can see here we have information about the human uh, genome assembly and the accession number, for example, here. So to find more information, you can click on human. Uh, that takes you to a species specific homepage where you have a search bar at the top, uh, which we're going to use later on as well, uh, as well as information about the gene annotation, the variation data, the comparative genomics and the regulation data as well. In the top left hand corner, there's information about the genome assembly itself. So you can see we're looking here at the GRCH38 genome assembly, um, and we've got the accession number there as well. Uh, and then at the bottom of that box, we have a link to the other genome assemblies available. So we can see that we have NCBI 36 uh, and GRCH 37. So if you want to look at data for the GRCH 37 human genome assembly, you can select that from the list and click go. And that will take you to a dedicated archive. So you can see here the logo at the top has changed to GRCH 37 and the URL has changed to grch37.ensemble.org. Uh, and now if you begin searching and navigating around Ensemble, you'll be retrieving data um, relating to the human GRCH37 genome assembly. So again, to go back to the main homepage, you can just add the www back into the prefix, and that will take you back to the Ensemble homepage, uh, the, the human species specific homepage. So the final thing I want to show you is uh, underneath this link here called more information and statistics. So if you click here, um, you'll find um, information about the genome assembly, when it was produced, its length as well, for example, uh, and as well as the number of annotated genes, coding genes and non-coding genes and pseudogenes, for example. Uh, and then some background information about the gene annotation process, which you can read as well. Um, the final thing I want to show you before the first exercise session um, is the Ensemble Genomes pages. So if you open a new tab in your browser and type www.ensemblegenomes.org, this will take you to um, our homepage for the non-vertebrate species. So here you can see we have a link to the uh, Ensemble SARS-CoV-2 genome browser as well as the ensemble plants, protists, metazoa, 
fungi uh, and bacteria as well. Um, so I, I saw that someone was asking about plants, so we'll use that as an example. If you click on go to ensemble plants, you can see that this takes you to the ensemble plants homepage. Um, it's laid out very similarly to the ensemble browser uh, and you can see how you can begin searching uh, and looking at the species that we have available as well for plants. You can navigate between the different uh, ensemble genomes pages. If you click on this white arrow next to the logo, you can navigate to ensemble for vertebrates, for example, or the other ensemble genomes pages as well. So if you click on ensemble bacteria, this will take you to our bacterial homepage uh, for our ensemble bacteria. And um, you can begin searching for the genomes here as well. Ensemble genomes for bacteria work slightly differently because we have so many bacterial genomes, um, it becomes very difficult to search through um, all of the available species uh, and the, the different genome assemblies for the different strains of the different species even. So here, if you begin typing your species of interest, maybe we can use E. coli as an example. Um, if you begin typing a species name, um, you're presented with a list um, of the, the species which match to your search term. So you can keep typing to find your species uh, and strain of interest, for example. But once you've identified your strain of interest, oh, there's a, an error there. But once you've identified your strain of interest, you can navigate to the species specific home page. like this. Perfect. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the first demo. Um, what I want to do now is give you a chance to have a go at the exercises for this module. Um, so what we can do, uh, or what you can do, uh, is navigate to the training materials uh, and click onto question book. And I'll just give you around about 10 minutes to have a go um, at the exercises that are on page three. So as I said, um, there are more exercises than possible to complete. So perhaps have a look at which ones are most interesting to you. Um, and then um, we'll be moving on in, in around 10 minutes. So there are a few questions um, that came up in that session. So I just want to quickly um, go over um, some of the answers just to um, check that um, everyone uh, feels happy to move on. So um, there is a question here that's, I think, unanswered at the moment. Um, Emily's currently um, talking um, to Liz about the ensemble bacteria pages. Um, but there's a question from Ramiro who says that you often see the terms genome assembly and genome build, um, I guess, in different papers and, and resources. Uh, so do they have the same meaning? Um, I guess, strictly, it I mean, it depends what people are sort of describing. So um, in Ensemble, we call a genome assembly, um, the actual genome itself that's been assembled um, uh, and then deposited, uh, sequenced and assembled and then deposited into a public archive. So the, the genome assembly is the sequence itself. Uh, and a species might have more than one genome assembly, as we saw for human. Um, we've got the GRCH37 genome assembly uh, and the GRCH38 genome assembly. Now, genome build, um, I, I would imagine um, in the different contexts that you see that, um, that phrasing, genome build, it probably does refer to genome assembly, um, but it might be that the people who say genome build uh, might be referring to the annotation, so the, the gene annotation itself. Um, it really depends on the context where you see those things written down. But in Ensemble, we would call it a genome assembly, um, referring to the genome itself. Uh, and then we would call it the, the gene build or the gene annotation. So they're the different um, terms that we use in Ensemble. 
So in the next part of this um, module, um, what we want to do is to begin exploring the ensemble genome and uh, the ensemble genomes uh, itself. Um, sorry, the genome annotations themselves. So in this session, we're going to look at a, re a page in ensemble that we call the region in detail. Um, so what we're going to do is have a look um, at the human genome. Uh, we're going to have a look at a region on chromosome four. Um, with these coordinates. So this is my start coordinate of interest, and this is my end coordinate. Uh, and then we're going to manipulate the view to see the data that we're interested in, um, all in, in relation to this region of interest on chromosome four. So if you're following along in the course book, you can find the screenshot starting on page 12, or you can follow along with me as well. So I'm going to open up the uh, Ensemble Genome Browser, um, where we were before. So this is the, where I finished on my, my demo when we were looking at the human genome assembly just now. So I'm going to click on the logo to go back to the home page. Uh, and I'm going to use the search bar to search for my region of interest. So the first thing that I need to do um, is to select my species of interest from the drop down box. So I can select human from the list here. It's at the top. It's our most commonly accessed species. Uh, and then in the search box itself, I can begin typing uh, my genomic coordinates. So firstly, we need to give our chromosome number. So in this case, we use the just the number itself, chromosome four. Then we have a colon. Then we have our start coordinate. So the start coordinate is one, two, two, eight, six, eight, zero, zero, zero. Uh, then we have a hyphen. Then we have our end coordinate, which is one, two, two, nine, four, six, zero, zero, zero. And I will copy and paste that into the chat box as well for you. Now, while you copy and paste that, I just wanted to um, just point out some important um, features of this format to you. So firstly, um, we do not use the, the CHR. So some databases and some resources will have the CHR prefix before the chromosome number like this but we don't have that uh, in Ensemble. Uh, and then you might also find that in some resources and papers and databases, we have commas after every third digit uh, within the coordinates. But again, in Ensemble, we don't have that. So it's just the chromosome number, colon, start, hyphen, end. No gaps, no other punctuation. Uh, and then when you're happy, you click go. And that will take you to the location tab. So you can see my page is currently loading. Um, and while it loads, I just want to point out some of the features on the page to you. So at the top, you can see what we call the location tab. So this is one of the important themes to remember about how the data is all organized in the Ensemble Genome Browser. So at the moment, we're looking at a genomic location. So we're in a location tab. If we search for a gene or a transcript or a phenotype later on, we will find that there are different types of tab that open in the blue bar here. So if we click on a gene, we'll open a gene tab. If we click on a phenotype, we'll open a phenotype tab. And this will all appear in the blue bar that we have uh, in the top here. And you can toggle between the different types of tab that, we, that we'll be seeing. Underneath the tab, you can see a menu over on the left-hand side. So at the moment, we're on a page called Region in Detail, which is what we can see in the main part of this page. But you can also see links to some of the comparative genomics views that we have that we'll explore later on in the course, uh, as well as links to other genome browsers such as UCSC, uh, NCBI, uh, and then the, the mapped region in GRCH37 for human as well. So if you want to look in other databases and other resources, you can use the external, like the links to external resources here as well. Underneath the, the menu, you can see five blue buttons, and these are really important. These help us to um, manipulate uh, and to export the data from this page. So firstly, we have a blue button called configure this page, which we're going to actually use uh, in just a moment's time. This allows us to add new views uh, to the page and to configure the way that the data is presented. So we're gonna use this in a moment. Custom tracks, the button underneath allows us to upload our own data to visualize in the Ensemble Genome Browser. And we're gonna have a go at doing that in the last session on Thursday. 
The export data button uh, underneath allows us to export the data from this region. So if you click on this blue button now, you can see this opens up a pop-up window um, that allows us to export the, the data. So the output format, um, we have a choice here. So by default, we're going to be retrieving the FASTA sequence. If you want to retrieve the sequence of this genomic region, for example, you can use the FASTA sequence option. But you can also choose one of a number of other formats as well. So you can choose um, to retrieve a feature file in CSV, tab separated, GTF, or GFF3 format, for example. So if you want to retrieve the gene features in GTF format, you can choose GTF. And then you can choose what type of features you want to um, be included in your GTF download, your GTF file download. So if I want to retrieve the sequence, for example, I would choose fast A. I would make sure that the region, the coordinates are exactly what I wanted, which I can modify here as well. Uh, I can also choose some masking if I want to mask some of the sequence, and then I would click next. So then you can either download the file itself, the FASTA file, which you can then obviously export into a primer designing tool or a BLAST or some other um, visualization software that you have. Um, or you can just view the sequence directly in the browser. If you click HTML, it will open up a new tab. And there you can see this is the genomic sequence uh, of this genome region. So this is our coordinate. Or this is our FASTA header with the sequence underneath. Going back in the tab, um, to the tab where we originally were. Um, you can get, uh, you can remove this uh, pop-up window by clicking on the tick in the top right-hand corner once you've viewed or downloaded your sequence, just to take you back to the main page. The final blue button on the left is a share this page option. Uh, and this allows you to create a unique URL that you can share with colleagues and collaborators um, to um, also view the page. Now, importantly, um, if you were to send your colleague or collaborator um, the main URL from the address bar, they would just then see the default page. But if you use the share this page option, uh, that allows the person who's viewing the link to see all of the data that you've um, added, perhaps the, the tracks that you've turned on, the data that you've um, changed the format of and highlighted and, and zoomed in, for example. So that's uh, a good way that you can begin sharing um, the ensemble views that you're looking at and collaborating. Now looking at the main part of the page, we can see that the page is split into these three separate views. So each view is more detailed than the last. So at the top, we have this chromosomal overview. So you can see we're looking at chromosome four. We've got the, um, the centromere here. Then we have the P arm and the Q arm of the chromosome four. Then we have our red box. This is our region of interest. So this is our region that we originally searched for with the coordinates that we have up here. Uh, and then outside of this red box, you can see these other green and red highlighted regions. Now, these are what we call assembly exceptions, um, which might be, for example, patches, which uh, are regions where there might have been a, a small fix to the, the genome sequence itself, um, or a haplotypic region as well, for example. So if you want to find out more information, you can click on the highlighted regions to find out about this assembly exceptions. Uh, to find out about this assembly exception. So you can read about what assembly exceptions are, you can compare it with the reference, or you can just view this exception itself. So in many cases, you, you need not worry about assembly exceptions uh, and patches and haplotypes and what they mean. Um, for example, we are looking at a region of the genome where there are no assembly exceptions uh, in our region of interest. So we need not worry in this case but if you're interested, you can click on them and find more information. Underneath, we have what we call the one megabase overview. So we, now you can see that we're beginning to focus in on this red box. This is our region of interest. So this is our start coordinate over on the left-hand side, and this is our end coordinate. And you can see that the data is now organized into what we call tracks. So we can see we've got these different tracks here. The first track that's the most important to look for is called the contigs track. This is the genome assembly itself. So if you remember back to my first presentation, we were talking about these contigs that were represented as these light and these dark blue blocks. So you can see that this is one contig here in light blue, 
and this is another contig here in dark blue and then an, another contig here in light blue. So the, the light and the dark doesn't mean anything. We just obviously alternate light and dark blue to show you how the, the genome contigs are arranged next to one another. Now, lots of people often ask me about the, 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 the regions here where there's obviously the start of one contig and the end of uh, the end of one contig and the start of another. Um, and in fact, this is something that is, is not to be worried about either in, in much detail, because in many cases, you'll see that the, the, the two contigs actually are joined end to end, and it's just one continuous sequence over the, over the, the bridge between those two contigs. So I like to think of it like a, a puzzle uh, in that obviously there's a picture uh, and the pieces come together and you're looking at the overall picture rather than the gap where those where the two pieces might be put together. So it's just where the genome assembly has been broken apart and then pieced back together again. And we can see those those junctions there, for example. In some cases, in, in other genome assemblies in different species, you might see gaps in between contigs, which, is, which, which would be represented as a white space. But in this case, there's no gaps in between our contigs. OK. Uh, and it's important to remember that the contigs, this blue bar represents the double-stranded DNA. So you can see that we have our blue blocks. This is double-stranded DNA. So it's um, five prime to three prime on the forward strand going left to right. Uh, and then on the reverse strand, five prime to three prime going right to left. In the tracks underneath, you can see we have other data types. So here we have the genes themselves, and these are represented as blocks. So you can see here, for example, the NUDS T6 gene, you can see the name underneath. And then we have the SPAT A5 gene here, this long gold one, you can see again the name underneath. Uh, and these genes uh, and these, the data in these tracks here are all aligned to this reference genome sequence. So we can see here, for example, that the FGF2 gene, this gold one here, is upstream of the SPAT A5 gene. So this gene here maps to this region of the genome. At the moment, you can see that the genes are represented as these colored blocks, and we're going to think about what the colors mean uh, in the later session today. But the legend is underneath as well. You can begin to uh, understand what the, what the color coordination means. At the very bottom, we can see that what we call the region in detail itself. So this image itself is our region of interest. So this is our start coordinate, our region of interest, and this is our end coordinate. Uh, over on the right hand side. So again, the data is arranged into tracks. So we can see our contigs track here. This is the double stranded DNA. And now you can see uh, a large number of other tracks. So we have two genes tracks, one for genes on the forward strand, which you can tell by the blue bar on the left hand side here. And one for genes on the reverse strand. And you can see all reverse stranded data uh, has this yellow colored or orange colored bar over on the left hand side. And now you can also see that the genes uh, are represented as the transcripts um, rather than as individual blocks they're represented as transcripts that are made up of exons and introns um, and we're going to discuss uh, and think about what this representation means in the next module as well. Um, there are some more tracks underneath uh, and then we have the legend at the bottom as well. So the data that we're seeing in this, um, in this view is what we show by default. This is just a small amount of data that's available. So if you go up to configure this page and click on the blue button, you'll open up a pop-up window that allows you to um, see all of the tracks that you can add uh, and manipulate their, their formatting as well. So at the moment, we can see the active tracks here that we're currently show by default. But then we have this menu on the left-hand side uh, where you can find and view all of the other tracks that you might be interested in. So I won't obviously be able to show you every single track. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of tracks to view. Um, so what I would advise you to do is to spend some time uh, in the exercises and later on as well, having a look through these different tracks and thinking about which ones are going to be able to show you the data that you're interested in. But I'll just add a couple as an example. So if you're interested in variation data, for example, you can click on variation. And you can see here now, these are all of the variation data tracks that we have available. We're gonna think about these tracks later on in the variation module tomorrow.
But you can see, for example, that one of these tracks is on. So the nomads, the track showing the nomad variants, the short variants from the nomad project is already shown by default. And you can tell that by the box here that's got this icon within it. If you want to turn a track on, all you do is you click the box. So if I want to turn on this track that's for the LOVD variants, I would click on the box here. And then in the pop-up window, I would choose the format. So normal in this case, and you can see now this track has been turned on. If I am not sure where a track is or where to find it in this, these categories over on the left-hand side, I can use the search function in the top left-hand corner. So if I want to look for um, protein alignments to the genome from Uniprot, for example, I can search for Uniprot and I'll find all of the tracks um, that are relating to Uniprot data. So if I want to look at the uh, protein, mammalian protein alignments from Uniprot, I can click on the box and then select normal as well. If you're not sure what a track is going to show you, you can click on the information icon and it will give you a short, a bit of a longer description about what you're actually going to be seeing when that track is turned on. So when you're happy, you can save and close with the tick in the top right hand corner of the, of the, of the pop-up window. And you can see now that the image is currently reloading. So it's going to be um, reloading with those new, those two new tracks that I turned on. Perfect. So now you can see everything there as it was before, but now I also have um, the alignments to the forward strand. We've got the blue bar here we can see. So we've got forward strand alignments um, from the Uniprot mammalian proteins. And then we also have um, the protein alignments from Uniprot mammalian proteins on the reverse strand as well. Um, you can see here, this is our LOVD variants that we added as well. So these are variants from the LOVD database within this track. So there's a couple of final things I want to show that you can do. Um, firstly, you can get more information uh, and manipulate a track by clicking on the track name. So if you click on the name, you can get some more information. You can change the format. You can highlight it, or you can turn that track off. So if I want to turn off the LOVD variants again, I can just click the cross and that track will be removed. If I want to view the track, perhaps I want to view this track called regulatory build. Um, maybe I want to see it further up the page. I can hover my mouse until it turns into this double headed arrow and then click and drag further up the page. So now I can see these regulatory features in the context of these genes uh, on the forward strand, for example. Finally, um, you can also use the options in this blue bar at the top to manipulate the view. So on the right hand side, you've got this dotted box and double headed arrow. So if you select the dotted box, it means that when you click and drag within the window, you will draw a box. So perhaps I'm interested in just this final exon of the NUD T6 gene here. Uh, I might be interested in this region. So when you click and drag, you're then given a pop-up window with an option to either mark, so to highlight the region, or you can jump to the region. So if you click jump, it will reload the page and re refocused on your new region of interest. So it's a way of zooming in. You can see now I'm, zoom I'm zoomed in on this NUD T6 exon that I, that I drew around. If I click on the double headed arrow, it means that now when I click and drag with my mouse, I can move up and down the genome, like uh, reloading every time I click and drag. So I'm moving up and down the genome. Over on the left-hand side, you can see some different options. So you can export this image, um, obviously for printing or publishing, for example. You can reset the configuration. So you can go back to the default view if you click on the cog with the circular arrow here, um, or you can reset the track order as well. So you can use the options uh, on the top left-hand here to reset um, the track order and the, the track um, configuration. And also you can export using the, the portrait picture icon. The final thing that I'll mention is that everything within this view is clickable. So if you're interested in something,
the best thing to do is to click on it. So here, for example, say I'm interested in this exon of NUD T6, I would click here and I'll get a pop-up window with more information. So I've got links to the gene, links to the genomic location, links to the transcript and the exons, links to the protein and some further information as well. Um, we're, we're going to explore some of these links later on uh, in the next session. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the demo um, for the region in detail section. Um, we have around 10 or 15 minutes to have a go at the exercises uh, and then we'll have a short break. So just to um, give you a, a map of what we're hoping to do today, um, we'll have 15 minutes of exercises to take us to um, 3.35 UK time. Um, then we'll have a 10 minute break um, just to give you a chance to go to the loo, get a drink, um, stretch your legs. Uh, and then we'll be starting our next session again at 3.45. So in 25 minutes time. So what I want to very quickly do um, is go back to the presentation um, just to show you. So if you go to the question book, the questions for this section are on pages four and five. So I can open the course book, uh, the question book, sorry. And you can see here, we have a question about exploring a genomic region in human, looking at CRISPR sites. So you need to find the, the, the track showing the CRISPR, um, the CRISPR track. Uh, and then we also have an example with rice, bacteria uh, and plasmodium as well. So you can have a pick and choose which exercises you would like to do that correspond with your own research areas and interests.